the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Wednesday, August 4th, 2021. If you enjoy this podcast, you should check out our newsletter, an often irreverent take on recent Court of Appeals opinions, which we publish every Friday. And please also check out our sister podcast, the documentary series Bound by Oath. Also, if you're in the D.C. area, you're invited to join us for a conference on September 10th, 2021 at George Mason University in Arlington, Virginia. It's all about the concept of the will of the people and its relationship to judicial review. You can find a link to the conference in the show notes where you can read all about it and register to attend. Today, we have a follow-up show of sorts where we're going to revisit two issues from past shows, one of which is revisit revisiting the same case. That case has taken a very interesting turn. You may remember a few months ago that IJ attorney Josh House joined us to tell the tale of a high school football coach who liked to pray after games, quietly to himself, at the 50-yard line, joined by several players, and even on one occasion, a gaggle of cameras and reporters. At that time, a panel on the Ninth Circuit ruled there was no constitutional violation for the school to tell him to stop. And that panel opinion stands for now. But last month, several Ninth Circuit judges had a lot to say about the case. Jo Josh rejoins us today to give the update and pontificate about where this case and this issue may be heading ne next. Welcome back, Josh. Thanks for having me, Anthony. In addition, today we're going to get back into guns. In May, we had noted Second Amendment scholar Dave Koppel to discuss the bare arms issue. The question of whether the Second Amendment extends to protecting carrying arms outside the home. The Supreme Court has a case before it on that question that arose from the Second Circuit. But that's not all the Second Circuit has done lately on the Second Amendment. Last week, it issued an opinion, which we'll hear about today, on the scope of the already established right to own guns in the home. And it also issued a few other opinions on various nooks and crannies of Second Amendment law. Well, reporting on these developments is IJ Constitutional Law Fellow Adam Griffin. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks for having me, Anthony. So, Josh, uh, we, we talked a lot about high school football and religion and speech and all kinds of things last time. Uh, and apparently a lot of judges uh, also want to talk about it. So get, bring us up to speed. Anthony, who doesn't want to talk about this? That's what of I course. want to know. Um, this is, I could, I could go on and on. In fact, this to me would be the ideal law school exam <laughs> question, this case. It is First Amendment. It is, um, it, you know, in two different ways, both free speech, law and religion. So it's, 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 it's a fun one. Um, so where is this case now? Well, so we've got nine different opinions from the Ninth Circuit, or statements, I should say, from Ninth Circuit judges on the Ninth Circuit's denial uh, of a petition to take this case on bonk. Um, the original panel that we, we spoke about um, a few months ago ruled that basically this high school football coach who would go to the 50-yard line after games to, to pray, he would take a knee, pray, the people would surround him. Um, players and and as you said on one event, people from the stands and, and reporters. Um, this football coach argued, um, or or the the panel denied his free exercise claims, and he kind of did on on two grounds. One, basically that the government can tell a government employee what they're saying when they're speaking on behalf of the government. It's known as sort of a government speech doctrine. It stems from a Supreme Court case called Garcetti. And the idea is that if you are a government employee uh, and, and you speak as part of your employment, of course the government can dictate what you say. And in this case, of course the government can tell him uh, not to uh, do certain things uh, you know, when he's a coach. And then the second reason, they said, look, even if that prayer were private and off duty in that one moment right after the game, um, he still hasn't stated a claim that his free exercise rights were violated because, um, because basically your free exercise rights only go so far as the government's establishment clause rights and that um, or establishment clause fears might be a better way of putting it. And so the government's fear of 
bridging the establishment clause of creating an establishment of religion um, can justify, can be a compelling interest to restrict the free exercise of an individual's religion. So that was the panel's decision. And the, they asked for en banc review. Uh, the Ninth Circuit uh, voted and decided, no, it was going to deny en banc review. But that generated uh, a variety of opinions, which brings us to, to what we're discussing today. We've got two opinions, two concurring opinions, that is concurring with the decision to deny review. And then you've got, um, I believe it's four, it might be, I think it might be five separate statements. Um, some of them are just statements that they agree very briefly with someone, another justice or another judge, excuse me. Um, but it's all these different statements saying, no, the court should have accepted this for en banc review because uh, it gets the law wrong, it gets the facts wrong. And so you really have these uh, judges trading barbs with both each other. And I would also say with the plaintiff in this case, the main concurrence in the denial, this is Judge Smith's concurrence, you get the sense that um, Judge Smith really doesn't like the plaintiff here. In fact, <laughs> goes so far as to, in the conclusion of the concurring statement, actually says um, that uh, uh, it's ironic that uh, the plaintiff wants permission to pray in public on a football field when Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount said that when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites who pray in public and instead should go into your room and close the door. Um, you know, I don't know of another example of a judge quoting a Bible verse back at a, a litigant yeah, that, quite that so That seemed directly. to kind of leave the law behind to get into a bit of scripture, uh, which was <laughs> yeah. a, a little bit unusual, I'd say. Very, very unusual. And, and you know, I... I, I I, I think what's also unusual is if you, if you look at both the concurrences as well as the um, the statements that uh, you know regarding denial, the the dissents from denial, you get into this issue of the judges simply don't agree what the relevant facts are, and yet both of them are are saying the, to the other side that you got the facts wrong. Um, you've got the the two concurring justices or judges go, hey, this. Uh, public character of these prayers, the fact that they're happening on property that the coach only has access to because he is the coach of the public school football team, because it's happening in full view of everyone, and because he made such a stink about it on social media, that uh, those all color the the legal analysis here. And that, that those facts make the speech more likely to be government speech. And they make the speech more likely to be uh, an endorsement of religion that the school district should be, you know, has a compelling interest to avoid in order not to violate the establishment clause. And then if you look at the other uh, statements, the, the, the dissentals, the, the statements denying in favor, um, sorry, dissenting from the denial, they, I like dissentals as a word, by the way. I yeah, I might just start using that because we're talking about so many different statements here. It's, it's, it's confusing me. Those statements, the dissentals, focus on what they said, the relevant facts, I think is how Judge Scanlon's um, uh, uh, dissental put it, what, which was that there is a, you know, sure, this coach was doing all these things, but at the end of the day, the right that was put forward at summary judgment, the right that that he was that the the plaintiff was trying to vindicate here was a right to pray privately, whether or not other people joined him, and whether or not there were people in the crowd. It was, can I, after a football game, pray on the field? And based on that narrow definition of the right being asserted, uh, the other judges go, these other facts, would, they're sort of irrelevant, these facts about how public it is, because that's not the legal question we're being asked to decide. Um, and so I, I could, look, Anthony, I could go on and on about all the, the intricacies of establishment clause and free exercise laws, but I think that is the key disagreement, is how relevant are those facts about the public nature um, of, of the, the prayer, and do they actually change the legal test that the court should apply? Adam, what do, what do you make of all this? So, Josh, I, there's been a lot of talk at the Supreme Court, and I think even in a previous iteration of this case, um, about whether the free exercise clause has not been given its full protective scope and whether the establishment clause has been given too great a sphere. Uh, I think Alito wrote a um, denial or a concurrence from dissent in the previous iteration of this case. Thomas has made uh, numerous statements about this. 
How how would that kind of more originalist approach, a, a stronger free exercise clause, maybe a, a weaker uh, establishment clause, how would that affect this case? Yeah, that's a good point. I think there are two kind of questions wrapped up in there, right? Which is one, how would an originalist approach sort of this, this whole question of establishment clause and free exercise? And then how would a stronger free exercise? Because I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily a question of originalism, but rather perhaps the exact test that's being used. Um, so I'm going to take the second question first, right? What would it look like to have a stronger free exercise clause? And a, a stronger free exercise in this context would say that perhaps the government's mere fear that it's going to endorse religion is not enough to trump an individual right to free exercise. The dissenters in this case point out over and over again, there's no plaintiff here. There's no litigant saying that my uh, rights have been violated because there's an establishment of religion, right? This is not a case that arose because some student showed up and said, uh, this is an establishment clause violation. I'm uncomfortable at this school. Uh, you know, th there's no, there's no, uh, li like in a normal establishment clause case, there's no suggestion that someone has been wronged by there, an establishment. There is a, there, it's a little sketchy, but there is one student, right? Who said he was an atheist, but he felt he had to join the prayer because of social pressure. Thought, That's right. But again, because the procedural posture of this case isn't that that student is a litigant, there's not been a whole record developed on whether or not, for example, that student's uh, fear of coercion is reasonable. There are a bunch of facts about that in the record, and the different opinions and statements give different weights to those to those sorts of facts. But I think my, my point is sort of unlike a normal establishment clause case, the, the center of attention is not on sort of the coach or the school creating a policy that coerces that student, but rather that student as sort of an incidental bystander of the of the coach's private of the privately intended speech. And so um, I think just the procedural posture of this case means that the free exercise clause, um, uh, or means that the establishment clause uh, concerns here are very, very theoretical. And so again, to go back to Adam's question, I think the free exercise, uh, you know, if we analyze what's going on here with the free exercise clause, it's that, well, the government can override an individual's free exercise rights if it has a compelling interest. The only compelling interest here is the the government, the school district, trying to avoid endorsing or, or taking a religious position, right? Trying to avoid establishing a religion. But again, there's not been a full record that it was establishing a, a religion. And so I think that's kind of the main issue is here is it's just the fear that an establishment might happen. And this might be where this case goes up on appeal, right, is on this question is, you know, if the Supreme Court were to take this, is, is that mere fear of an establishment enough to trump an individual's free exercise rights? So to answer Adam's question, uh, I think a stronger free exercise clause would say something like, no, that mere fear is not enough to defeat the individual's rights. And then as for the originalist question, I would just point to Judge Nelson's dissental in this case. And Judge Nelson says, you know, uh, there's a whole originalist analysis of what is an establishment of religion. And so instead of focusing on like, you know, whether there's this fear of an endorsement of religion that the coach would be doing, uh, and therefore the school district can have a policy that the coach avoid endorsing on behalf of the school a religion, we should instead look to was the coach or the school establishing a religion as that meant, you know, as that would have meant back at the, at the founding. And that would be this sort of original historical test rather than the, the what's used is the, the Lemon versus Kurtzman test. And specifically in this case, the, uh, the prong of that test that concerns endorsing a religion. And so, um, you know, I, I think an originalist would, would here would go towards Judge Nelson's analysis and look at the historical uh, definition of an establishment. And it's interesting that this case, the other prong of Lemon is the coercion test. And us talking about the the idea that the establishment clause interest was just a fear of establishment, not an actual establishment, and maybe a fear that students would be coerced, and there might have been some evidence of that. But was did either did any of the opinions rely heavily on that coercion prong on a finding that either students or the public was coerced into um, some kind of religious demonstration that violated their conscience in a way that would um, lead to an establishment of religion? 
Yeah, absolutely. They did. I mean, I think that's sort of the fallback position that the the peop, the um, the statements that were defending the denial um, are kind of focusing on is this case out of uh, this the Santa Fe Independent School District case, which uh, precisely had to deal with this coercion prong. That was the basis for that decision, and th- there the issue uh, in that case was a was a. Uh, a Football, again, it was a football case, and it had to do with the students doing a pregame prayer, and they'd have access to the PA system. They, the school had a policy of allowing them uh, to do the prayer. It was part of sort of the pregame festivities. And the Supreme Court in that case said the fact that it was a school sort of sanctioned policy did create um, this element of sort of coercion for like the other parts of the student body. And it certainly created the appearance that there was an endorsement happening. Um, uh, that is the school that was endorsing a, a, you know, a religion. And so, you know, I, I think that the coercion, this is something that those statements keep coming back to is they keep coming back to that case. They keep coming back to the student that Anthony brought up, which was this one student who said he felt like he was sort of had to pray just to go along uh, with the coach's routine because he didn't want to lose playing time, but he himself was uh, an atheist and, and not religious. And so, you know, I, I think coercion is is another flashpoint for this case on appeal, which is if, if there is a compelling interest in overriding free exercise uh, rights um, as a sort of prophylactic to avoid an establishment clause violation, is it enough, is that coercion prong enough to create that possible uh, establishment clause violation? And if so, there's another even layer to this. I, could, I told you I could keep going on. <laughs> is the coercion objective or subjective? Is, it, is there actually coercion or is it that the student felt coerced? And then is it a reasonable person feeling coerced or is it a reasonable student who is you know, 14, 15, 16 years old feeling coerced? So there are layers upon layers and I am just excited to see where this case goes forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to cut you off here. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but I do have another question. Uh, which is what? What is your feeling about the Supreme Court taking this case? Because when they when they originally didn't take the case on a preliminary injunction uh, um, posture, and Justice Alito wrote the, this statement, and uh, they said, "Well, we want more factual development," but then we we might take it on a final judgment. Now there's factual development. It is a lot messier, I think, than it was presented at the preliminary injunction stage. Do you think they'll want to bite? Uh, because I, I, the fr- frankly, after reading the the circuit opinion when we when we talked about it back in April, um, this this there's way more dissents here than I expected, and so I wonder if there's more to this case than you know people who um, aren't as into the the uh, these these issues might uh, surmise. So perhaps there's a good chance the court will take the case, or perhaps. You know, given the the messy facts, it's just not worth it. Yeah, I mean, the facts are messy, but I think the facts are sort of perhaps messier precisely because there are these two legal issues. I think in a way, had had there been like a single issue, either it was just whether the the coach was speaking uh, as a government employee or not, uh, the Garcetti issue, or whether it was just you know the free exercise versus establishment clause, I think it might have prevented uh, presented a simpler vehicle for the courts to take on review, to narrow it to the relevant facts, and then to just decide those one of those issues. The fact that the, the Ninth Circuit decided sort of a an alternative holding where, okay, even if it's not government speech, it, there's still this establishment clause slash free exercise issue. I, I think that that's what makes this so muddy. Um, because I certainly think that the, the government speech issue is the one that Alito's opinion was some of the most concerned with, right? Was this idea, if you read um, Alito's concurrence for the denial of, of cert, you know, he, there's this example of what if a teacher sits there and prays in the cafeteria uh, during the school day? That's clearly private speech, and it would seem, but it would seem like that the the Ninth Circuit's very broad application of the Garcetti test is saying almost anything a teacher does, just by virtue of their position as a teacher. Uh, could be construed as sort of government speech and therefore subject to the school district's regulation. And so I think to, that would that is, a, I, I think, a, a question that the Supreme Court looks like it's chomping at the bit to, to kind of, at least if you, if you take Alito's concurrence as definitive on that, is chomping at the bit to decide. I think the messiness, as with any law and religion case, is going to be that, that free exercise establishment question. So I just don't know about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've had many... Uh, 
establishment co- clause cases or and free exercise too, where you have many different opinions from the court, a split the decisions often. Uh, this, if you if you count up just the the substantive opinions, it was six. Um, the Ninth Circuit, of course, is famous for having a lot of judges saying a lot of things, including Judge O'Scanlan, who because he's He's a senior. He couldn't vote on the on decision of whether to give on bonk, but he could make a statement. And he sure did make a statement. So um, always interesting in the Ninth Circuit. And of course, uh, is an interesting case that may be that may be coming to the Supreme Court. The case is Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. And perhaps look at it uh, at a cert petition uh, near you. So thank you, Josh, for for that uh, summary. And we're going to go on to Adam with Henry versus County of Nas- Nassau, hope I said that right, in the Second Circuit, and some other Second Amendment stuff in the Second Circuit, too. So take it away. Thanks, Anthony. There is a, a lot of Second Amendment activity in the Second Circuit. Uh, in addition to uh, the cert petition um, in New York Rifle and Pistol that we talked about a few episodes ago, uh, there was also this case, Henry versus County of Nassau, and uh, two other cases um, out of the Second Circuit uh, dealing with this gun rights issue. Uh, one is uh, United States versus uh, Javier Perez, uh, which dealt with an immigrant's right to keep and bear arms and uh, the, the scope of the Second Amendment right when it comes to an immigrant. And they applied the Second Amendment uh, intermediate scrutiny and found that the restriction on his rights were um, upheld uh, with an interesting concurrence by Judge Menashe um, questioning whether uh, immigrants should have full Second Amendment protections. Uh, there was another case on uh, fingerprinting um, and the Second Amendment, and it was uh, held to be moot. Uh, but the case that we're dealing with today out of the Second Circuit is uh, Henry versus County of Nassau, which is a county in New York. Um, Lambert Henry uh, was accused of having a dispute with his daughter over grades, and he blocked the door and put her in a headlock. And then she got a protective order against him. Uh, That started a cascade. The protective order was instituted. His pistol license was revoked based on a New York policy. And there's a separate New York policy that says if your uh, pistol license is suspended or revoked, that you lose your right to possess all firearms, including rifles and shotguns. The police showed up and confiscated all of his guns. Uh, Five months later, the uh, order of protection was revoked or was uh, allowed to lapse, and the family court dismissed the action. Two months later, he asked for his... uh, pistol license back and his firearms back. And the um, and the county said a year and a half later told him, no, you can't have your firearms back. Your pistol license is uh, completely revoked. And so are all your firearm rights. Um, you can apply again in five years, but there's no guarantee that you will actually get your rights um, back at the end of that time. So he sued and regular listeners of uh, the podcast will recognize Section 1983. He brought a Section 1983 lawsuit in federal court. Uh, to protect his Second Amendment rights. And the district court did a really interesting thing. The the district court said, uh, your Second Amendment rights have barely been infringed because the the core of the Second Amendment is a collective right, not an individual right. The district court said, um, Mr. Henry's uh, burden is, is light here because he did not allege that the county of Nassau had infringed the Second Amendment for all people. And because he'd only alleged that as an individual, his right had been infringed, it wasn't really that big of a burden. And the Second Circuit said, um, well, not so fast. That's not what the precedent said. Um, And that would make a real oddity of the Second Amendment. Um, They said that the core of the Second Amendment is the right of law-abiding, responsible gun owners to protect their home and hearth. And uh, in making this decision, they said the Second Amendment is not at core a collective right. It's an individual right. Um, and that the Second Amendment protects an individual right no less than any other right in the Bill of Rights. Um, And this is a lot like what we talk about at IJ, that there there shouldn't be any second-tier rights, and that all the rights in the Bill of Rights, that all of your rights should be treated as fundamental individual rights. And the Second Circuit went on to apply a a traditional Second Amendment test. Um, You know, what is the core of the Second Amendment right? It's an individual right. And then how substantial is the burden? They said the burden was substantial because by the end of this process, he would be without firearms completely uh, for seven years and no guarantee of getting them back at the end. And then they assessed whether he was law-abiding and responsible. Uh, If he was law-abiding and responsible, strict scrutiny should apply. If he's not law-abiding and responsible, uh, then intermediate scrutiny would still apply. 
They said they could not determine whether he was law-abiding or responsible based on the evidence and applied intermediate scrutiny, but still found that his claim should proceed to the merits. And they did so based on the facts and based on the evidence. Uh, they said, you know, look, he lost his right for seven years at least to completely possess any firearm based on an order of protection that was not subject to adversarial testing. There was one allegation in an order of protection issued, and that's what had all of his rights Revo- right. all of and his it, was, it was provided ex parte, right? So he it was didn't ex parte. even show That's up correct. to defend himself. Yeah. So he had no way to defend himself, no adversarial testing, no, um, no ability to bring any evidence on his own defense. And that's what lost him his right. And the court said, no, facts matter. Evidence matters. If you're going to lose your right, your Second Amendment right, your fundamental right, you have to be able to present evidence to support your case and to challenge any case against you. And that's something we also talk about at IJ, that facts matter, evidence matters, especially when it comes to your fundamental rights. And so the court, the Second Circuit here said, we're going to take the evidence seriously. We're going to take the facts seriously. Uh, district court, you, you did not look at his evidence, and you've got to look at his evidence. And so they're allowing the claim to proceed to the merits so that he can try to bring that evidence to show that he is law-abiding, that he is responsible. He had an affidavit from his wife and daughter saying that. Um, and the evidence that was put up against him, the Second Circuit had no evidence that the district court had considered his evidence and had only considered the county's evidence. And that kind of rubber stamp thumb on the scale for the, the government's position was rejected by the Second Circuit. Um, and, you know, I think that this is a, a really interesting case because it deals with something that we are, we're often looking at at IJ, where um, there are certain rights that are treated as very fundamental like the First Amendment, um, the, the court drew a direct analogy to the First Amendment. They said we would never say that someone hadn't alleged a core violation of the First Amendment simply because they hadn't alleged that all people everywhere had had their uh, speech restricted. One person's speech restriction is enough to trigger a First Amendment violation. It's ridiculous to even think about that. Right, exactly. But we, we see that with um, you know, the, the public use clause and the takings clause becomes a public purpose. The Second Amendment, which is an individual right to keep and bear arms, becomes a collective right. Um, The Free Exercise Clause uh, sometimes is is seen as a non-discrimination provision rather than an individual rights provision. And it's that kind of um, treating rights, certain rights as second tier and other rights as more fundamental um, that the Second Circuit was uh, rejecting with respect to the Second Amendment here. Josh, uh, what's your thoughts about tiers of rights? Does the, the court get it right here? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it does. I think um, Adam hit the nail on the head. And actually, I was you know I was going to ask Adam um, about how does this fit into the larger body, if you know, on the Second Amendment issues that are cropping up kind of across the states right now, where it does look like there are courts that simply don't want to give full protection to the Second Amendment in the way that they do um, other other rights. Did did you kind of look and compare this to the other cases kind of percolating? Uh, throughout the, the, the country? So I think this, this does fit into that trend. Um, I mean, this is a direct application of Heller. Uh, Heller decided that the Second Amendment was an individual right and that the core right was of law-abiding responsible citizens to keep and bear arms to defend their homes. And so it was a direct application of Heller. And you see the district court saying, well, yeah, Heller said that it's an individual right, but that's really a peripheral right. The core is still that collective right which is what the dissent in Heller had argued, that it was a collective right of the people to keep and bear arms. So it's attempting to kind of marginalize Heller's individual rights holding and still kind of pivot back to the collective rights holding. And if you look at um, the uh, short circuit podcast we had with uh, David Koppel, he talked about the Ninth Circuit opinion, um, the Young opinion, where he said, you know, it seems like a really robust and scholarly opinion, but if you look at the source material underlying it, that it's really not saying what the court says it stands for. And it looks like the court is just trying to um, make the Second Amendment a second class right. And so I I think that that is sort of what's going on here is that there is there is a lot of uh, hesitancy on the part of courts to give the Second Amendment equal protection um, among other bills, uh, among other rights in the Bill of Rights, like the First Amendment freedom of speech. And that's probably part of the reason that there's been a lot of cert petitions and why the court took New York Rifle and Pistol to sort of clarify um, if the Second Amendment is as uh, protective of the right to keep and bear arms as the First Amendment is for free speech, for instance, I, I think that's all right. And uh, if to get, I wouldn't really defend what the district court did here, but I think you could say what happened with the district court in saying it's a collective right, which of course is nonsense because the um, Heller explicitly said it's an individual right to keep and bear arms. That right, the problem with since Heller and McDonald. 
and it's the only time the Supreme Court has spoken on this issue, is that they didn't spell out how the right is protected in our normal parlance, whether you like it or not, of tiers of scrutiny, whether it's strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, heightened scrutiny, rational basis, whatever it's going to be. How do you apply this right? They, they said, well, look, there's a, there's a traditional right to, um, to keep and bear arms of, of handguns in the home, and that has been violated in the, these two cases, the Heller and McDonald, because it was basically a complete prohibition on that. And so uh, the the right is has been violated in both of those cases. But when you try to translate that into other situations and you don't have the tiers of scrutiny you know, rubric to go by, you can see how courts might try to take from that, perhaps not with the greatest of intention, fair minded of intentions regarding the, the right to, to own firearms, but they might translate it in ways like, well, OK, Heller was a case about an ordinance that was across the board. Um, and this is just about an order of protection for one guy. And so it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't translate. And so I need to make it up. And I'm going to say that in that case, it's, you know, it only even though it's an individual right, it only applies collectively. Um, I don't think that's the right analysis, but it's an example of what courts are doing because they don't have very much information to go by from the Supreme Court. You know, whether whether they have good intentions or not, they don't have very much information to go by, which is why it is very good that the Supreme Court has taken another case, the, the New York case, uh, on um, on the right to, to bear arms and is going to hopefully flesh that out a little bit. Maybe it'll tell us about tiers of scrutiny. Maybe it'll tell us about something else. But we're not going to have this, you know, Heller box that really we've been because McDonald was just applying Heller to the states where that we've been stuck in since 2008. And perhaps we'll have less cases like that after uh, we have some some more flesh on the bone. I think that's a really good point, Anthony, that and you've heard a lot of scholars and litigators calling for the Supreme Court to take these cases because they do need more guidance. Um, Heller was provided a lot of uh, clarity to the Second Amendment that didn't exist before it. But there needs to be more cases, more decisions uh, fleshing that right out. And Heller relied on a uh, an originalist sort of history and tradition approach that doesn't always fit neatly into the tiers of scrutiny. Um, and, and people have questioned whether the tiers of scrutiny itself is originalist. And so I think that there is some tension in applying Heller and the Second Amendment to this tiers of scrutiny box with this um, you know, originalist sort of history and tradition approach that might would give uh, the Second Amendment sort of its own unique scope of protection based on the Second Amendment as an independent right, uh, rather than try and um, slot the Second Amendment or any rights into this tiers of scrutiny uh, analysis. And, and you know, there's a tie in there to the Bremerton case. It's the it's the case, <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. No, there really is because you know I mentioned in, in response to Adam's question earlier about the originalism problem with in Bremerton. You know, Judge Nelson uh, goes on in, in the dissental. Um, about the originalist test and how Lemon versus Kurtzman should be should be tossed out in favor of this originalist approach, this historical approach, similar to what Heller set forth for the Second Amendment. The problem, of course, and this is perhaps why Lemon is this sort of zombie case that keeps coming back no matter how often the Supreme Court kills it, is that it's just so much easier to apply a sort of three-pronged test that can you know, come up on a bar exam than it is. Can you imagine on a bar exam if someone asked you to uh, do a, the originalist analysis of some hypothetical like on a test? Like it would just be – it would be chaos, right? And so I think the, the, the courts are just gravitating toward some sort – sort of, you know, give us something, give us a standard. And whether that's in the Establishment Clause context or here in the Second Amendment, you know, context, I think what you have is the originalists on the court going, it's not as easy. History is complicated. You can't just give you a test. And you have lower courts and lawyers just begging for, you know, it's it's like law students just begging for like the black letter law outline of the problem so they don't have to read all the yeah. cases and do all the history. And I, and um, I don't and you, blame them because law, law can can be that way. We need we we need rules of thumb to actually translate it into into you know lower court rulings. Yeah. I think that that is something that the Second Circuit did well um, in in the Second Amendment context. They said, um, you know, the core of the right is an individual right, and there's a two part test for that right. Is it um, substantially like is the core infringed? Is it a law abiding responsible citizen? And then two. How substantial is the burden? And, you know, they said district court, go back and apply this two-part test, determine the level of scrutiny based on that two-part test. 
and you know proceed on the merits based on the facts and the evidence from there. And it, it is that kind of uh, structure that I think the Supreme Court is going to have to be more express about in New York Rifle and Pistol to give lower courts a sense of what is the real scope of protection for the Second Amendment. And if Kennedy versus Bremerton is granted or another free exercise clause case, hopefully the court provides a similar um, sort of implementable framework that gives lower courts the extent of protection for the individual right at issue. You know, yeah, it's it's funny uh, in that way that that Heller ruled that something was an individual right, said that a law was unconstitutional, but didn't exactly provide preside, uh, provide a test for how to apply that in the future. And I think very few people would compare Heller with um, Lawrence versus Texas, but in a funny way, they're similar because Lawrence versus Texas, of course, about the the sodomy law in Texas, um, didn't say what scrutiny it was applying. Didn't say it was rational basis. Didn't say it was height. And a lot of people read it as rational basis case. But Justice Kennedy just kind of, you know, said this is a bad law. And uh, I mean, it was more than that, but uh, it it doesn't make any sense. And so therefore, it's unconstitutional. And no one knew what to do with it. Um, and of course, it had ramifications after that. But uh, but it was it was unclear. Um, and so, you know, it takes more than one case to figure these things out, uh, more than several cases sometimes. So um, thank you, Adam, for your, your explanation of this case, which seems like a great case of judicial engagement from the Second Circuit. And we'll look forward to what else the Second Circuit has to say about the Second Amendment in the future. Uh, thank you, Anthony. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Josh. And thank you, all your listeners, for sticking with us here on Short Circuit this week. Uh, we'll be back next week. But in the meantime, I would ask that all of you get engaged. Mm-hmm.